These lectures are made possible by a very generous bequest from New York architect Robert Blunt and his wife Rose. Um, and the connection to journalism in Western is pretty deep. So Blunt's grandfather was a man named Edward Clissold, who was a reporter, a journalist his whole life. Um, the series is named for him. He was a journalist who spent 30 years working for the London Advertiser, which was the competitor newspaper to the London Free Press, back when there was more than one newspaper in the city at the time. Uh, we might really look forward to this one at some point, but anyway. Um, so he finished up his career as an editor and passed away in 1915. Um, but that wasn't the end of the connection between the Clissold clan and journalism. Uh, his son became a reporter for the Buffalo Courier. His great-grandson is none other than Robert Fulford, a columnist for uh, the National Post. And uh, the Global Mail columnist, Marcus, uh, he is Clissold's great-great-grandson. Mm -hmm. Told Marcus's son is also going into journalism, and I'm running out of grades. <laughs> so that's a serious pedigree in terms of journalism and plus old name. Uh, but on to tonight. So Craig is the founding editor of BuzzFeed Canada, and he leads a global beat for BuzzFeed News covering online misinformation and fake news. And I think you've got a team of three now. Is that right? Yes. And they're, they're just breaking a big story as we <laughs> speak. Uh, so his journalism and books have been honored by uh, the Mirror Awards, the U.S. National Press Club, the National Magazine Awards, the Canadian Online Publishing Awards, and Crime Writers of Canada. So that's also a nice pedigree. Um, he's also the founder of uh, Emergent Info, .info, a rumor tracking project that was developed as part of the fellowship of the Tau Center for Digital Journalism at Columbia. Um, previously, Craig was part of the team that launched Open File, an online news startup that delivered community-driven reporting in six Canadian cities. He's the former managing editor of PBS Media Chef, and he's been a columnist for the Globe Mail, the Toronto Star, and Columbia Journalism Review. From 2004 to 2015, he wrote Regret the Air, and actually there was a previous version of that too, right? <laughs> uh, no, it started in 2004. Was it old? Oh, yeah. I it was old. Okay. <laughs> I still loved it when it was. Um, a blog about media accuracy and corrections, and if you ever have a chance, check it out. It really is it's very entertaining reading. Uh, it's all about the mistakes that reporters make and then correcting them afterwards. Um, and that's now part of the Pointer Institute of Media Studies. So please join me in welcoming Craig Silverman. Thank you very much. You're welcome. All right, so yes, I have three microphones. Are we, are we good with all three? You guys can hear me? Okay, excellent. I'm going to put this back here. Um, so thank you all for coming. I know it's such a beautiful day outside, you'd rather be there, right? Um, so uh, I, uh, I'm hopefully going to you know, give you some information that's useful and, and potentially for the students here and for any working journalists here, some things to think about when you're encountering uh, misinformation as well, because it, it is actually uh, a really big challenge of how you knock down the fake stuff and make things that are true spread just as much. Uh, and so to kind of get to that point, I want to give a little bit of an overview of you know, what I see as the online misinformation ecosystem. Uh, we've been hearing the term fake news a lot. It's not just that, and I'll sort of define how I see fake news compared to other things. Uh, talk a little bit about that, um, some of the consequences of online misinformation, the different types we see, uh, and, and spend a little bit of time on fake news because it's such a topic that, um, unfortunately, we can't avoid anymore. Um, I've, I've been covering it now for almost three years, and I'm sick of hearing the term fake news. I don't know about all of you. But, uh, but because it's, it's something that's being talked about so much, uh, it's important to kind of dig in on it a little bit. And I, I thought to start, um, something that, that might be useful and interesting is to do a little bit of a case study here. So um, I don't know if anyone encountered this article. Uh, the date on it says November, but it's actually almost a year old. This is a completely fake story from a completely fake website. Um, rather than being the real ABC News website, it was abcnews.co.com, um, or actually, sorry, .com.co. And uh, it's run by a guy in Arizona named Paul Horner. And so this was a completely fake article he put up 
um, you know, when before Trump had won the nomination and all that, and claiming that, you know, a, pro a protester was paid to go up uh, out there against him. And of course now, you know, that's something that you hear about a lot, people accusing folks who are protesting Trump or at other protests as being paid protesters. And this is a case where a completely false story has contributed a little bit to the narrative of what's actually going on in U.S. politics right now. So what helps something like that get out there? Well, this was a pretty big viral hit, um, you know, hundreds of thousands of engagements on Facebook. Uh, the traffic counter on it says 95,000 views. It's much more than that. Um, it, you know, I, I know the guy who, who wrote this. I've interviewed him a few times. That's not the accurate number. So it reached a lot of people. And one of the reasons why it reached a lot of people, and I think people started to believe it, is that uh, it actually was propagated by some folks who, you know, who otherwise would be seen as you know, very credible. So Kellyanne Conway had tweeted it back in October. Uh, uh, Corey Lewandowski, at one point, another one of the uh, campaign managers for Donald Trump had tweeted it. One of Donald Trump's sons tweeted it. And, you know, this we'll talk about a, in a little bit, you know, so why do we fall for stuff that's false? And sometimes it's information that we hope is true or information that we are predisposed to believe is true. And I think that's one of the things going on here. I don't think any of them knew this was a completely false story. I think they all saw it and it reinforced something that they had maybe suspected or hoped was true, and so they put it out there on Twitter. And when people who are in positions of authority, whether with a campaign or otherwise, put out information that's false, it obviously you know, adds credibility to it. And so when Donald Trump or someone else in a position of power is saying things that are not true, even if they are easily debunked, even if the stuff is clearly false, it's still going to take hold among a certain amount of people. And this really has taken hold. So, um, you know, so we've, we've seen tons of stories now, uh, mostly in the kind of, and I'll talk a bit more about these, the sort of what are called now hyperpartisan sites. So there's been partisan media for a long time. But now we have sort of a new breed that are really optimized for Facebook that really take things uh, extra far. And so they have seized upon these stories. And now anytime there's a protest, there's always claims about um, fake protesters and paid protesters. And, and it's gotten to the point where it kind of not just websites that are you know playing for one side or another are pushing this out there this is just a regular guy who was in austin one day had sort of seen these reports about um fake protesters saw a bunch of buses and knew there was um some protests going on and he tweeted out these pictures and said hey they're bussing in these anti-drug protesters it's not real you know uh tens of thousands of retweets later he realized he you know he realized that no those buses were for something completely different and so here's a guy, he wasn't actively trying to fool people. He just saw it, had this information in his head, and put this out there. And it really took off like crazy on Twitter. So this is what's happening a lot today. You know, something gets seeded, and it gets pushed out by other people, and it gets into certain networks. And all of a sudden, you have average folks just seeing a bunch of buses and thinking, oh, you know, pay protesters. Uh, and so one of the, like, so what, what does this mean, and why does it matter? Well. You know, when, when people are kind of circulating this kind of stuff, um, a lot of times, particularly during the election, we saw that it was really aimed at dividing people. It was aimed at exacerbating, um, you know, the belief that the other side is terrible. And that starts to create polarization in society. It starts to, to bring people apart. And that's a really important piece of it. Um, you know, they also, they take our attention. They take our attention away from other things that are actually true and actually real. And everyone is fighting for your attention now um, because of our smartphones and there's so much competition for it. This, is, this stuff is aimed to steal your attention away. It drives, uh, it creates confusion and, and it, again, it creates that sense of polarization in society. And that's one of the real dangers of this. It's, even if you're not falling for this stuff all the time, if over time you're consuming it and it's pushing you towards one way of thinking and one way of believing, it's pushing you perhaps away from other people and, and in the process can potentially collapse that middle ground where we actually all agree on what reality is and all agree on what facts are, but still actually can disagree about them. Um, it's not about everybody thinking the same way, but having a shared set of facts actually enables you to disagree in ways where hopefully you know, you're, you're actually doing something productive. Uh, and so let's, let's look at the different types of online misinformation. Uh, this is how I think of it. This is not like the only way to view the different types of misinformation out there. There are lots of people who are now talking about this. Uh, and that's, that's a great thing. You know, for me, I break it down into a few categories. So one category is a very old and familiar one. And this is, this is propaganda. So talking about um, you know, false information or misleading information that's being created for political or ideological reasons can be from a state, can be from another entity. This is, this is very, very old um, and continues today, especially online. And th the way that I distinguish between 
propaganda and fake news is that you know they're both they both can be completely false they're both being consciously created to mislead or to spread false information but the difference between for me propaganda and fake news is that fake news has an economic interest in it so that story about the paid protesters from the guy in Arizona he runs a bunch of fake news websites and comes up with hoaxes to make money that's that's how he's actually earned his living for at least a couple of years now uh, and, and I'll break that down a little bit more, but that's a new kind of breed because of the information environment we live in, because of the way the economics of online content work. Whereas something like this, propaganda has been around forever. And this particular example, uh, this is a photo that came from the North Korea News Service. So right there, you know this is propaganda. It's coming from the North Korea News Service. And so when news organizations publish this photo, they all said that. They're like, this is them. Um, they said it was them simulating a land invasion on South Korea. So a little bit of saber rattling. But even though you f they flagged it as propaganda, there was still an element of it that, that was still kind of convincing people and still getting past that, which is that when people looked at the photo really closely, they realized that a bunch of these landing craft, only a couple of them were actually real, and the others had been cloned in Photoshop. So they have like maybe a couple of these vessels. And the other ones, they just sort of added them in to make it seem like they have more, and some of the soldiers as well. And so in this case, even if you put the words around it and say, well, this is from North Korea. This is them trying to sort of you know, show that they're powerful and dangerous. Uh, even, even that, even if you flag it and give that context, people would have looked at this and maybe would have thought, oh, they've actually got you know, a decent amount of those landing craft. And that's kind of intimidating. Uh, and so often, this is one of the challenges we have again with debunking, is that oftentimes you know, the images or one piece of it will just overshadow everything else you're doing to try and put the context around it. It's a big challenge for journalists. Um, a couple more examples, digital examples. Uh, you know, Russia Today is, is a, uh, a global network of TV, uh, of, of TV stations and with an associated website funded by the Russian government. They do often push out misinformation. And these are two examples. Uh, you know, the one on the right is just a straight up conspiracy theory that they had, had put out in their Spanish version. The one on the left, if you guys remember MH17, the plane that was shot down over Ukraine. So um, all of the evidence that has been done, there's been several investigations, show that it was shot down by a Russian miss missile launcher in kind of Russian occupied territory. Uh, and that's what's been found. And, and since, since day one, uh, the, the Russian government has been trying to kind of muddy the waters on that and say, well, no, it wasn't a missile launcher that you know, was traced back to Russia. And so one of the things they did was the Ministry of Defense actually put out a report questioning this. And they had this image on the left there. And the image on the left is them showing MH17 saying, well, it, it was nowhere near where people are claiming it was. And this guy, Elliot Higgins, who's kind of an independent investigator, said, well, that's actually not a Malaysia Airlines plane because the logo for Malaysian Airlines and the logo on that plane are completely different. And then actually, if you Google Malaysian Airlines, uh, one of the first images was that one. So literally, someone in the Russian Ministry of Defense was like, let's find another plane, and let's put it in this report. Um, and so this is happening a lot. And particularly online, I'll give you another example of this in a second. Um, there's also people who just kind of like to mess with folks online. Uh, they don't have an ideological motive. They're not getting any profit from it. They just kind of enjoy it. Uh, this on the left here was, you know, uh, the queen had missed a couple of public events, and so people were worried about her health. So some, some people went on Twitter, created fake BBC accounts, and started tweeting that she had died. Um, we see the death hoaxes a lot. The, the, the one uh, uh, um, on the other side here, um, I'm doing like my left versus your right and all that. Um, so the other tweet uh, was from Hurricane Sandy claiming that New York Stock Exchange floor had flooded. And it hadn't. Um, and this was an account that was kind of well known and had a lot of followers. And it was a guy who actually works in politics in New York State who had just decided to put out false information. And it ended up on CNN and the Weather Network and these other places. So like, why would people do that? I know this is a question that people wonder about. So here's a guy. His name is Tommaso De Benedetti. Uh, his day job is that he's an Italian school teacher. Is somebody named Tommaso De Benedetti here? I see people looking. <laughs> it's not him. He's not here, I don't think. Um, and, uh, and so his day, he's teaching kids during the day. And in his spare time, he likes to create Twitter accounts for famous people and tweet out hoaxes. That's actually like his hobby. Um, he, I think he actually considers it almost an art form. The other thing he did was years ago, he, and he said this was done to prove how um, corrupt and pathetic Italian media is. He created a bunch of fabricated interviews with famous novelists, like uh, you know, famous American novelists, and sold them to Italian newspapers, saying, ah, I'm a freelancer. I got this amazing interview with this author. And then they ran them, and then he was exposed for it. 
So he's actually, like, he's so proud of this that after, like, we did a story debunking the Queen hoax that she had died. And Tommaso, after we published that, sent me an email and was like, hey, by the way, that was me, Craig, just so you know. <laughs> so he's like, he's that, he's actually that proud of it. He's like, this was my artwork. Wow, it was wonderful, you know? Uh, and here's another one. This is a Canadian example. This is from a few years ago. This video went up on YouTube claiming that there was a shark in Lake Ontario. You guys remember this? Uh, and so, so nobody really, nobody in media fell for it. They wrote it up being like, there's this video, and yes, the Lake Ontario is freshwater, so it's not a shark, you know. Um, but it was like, like, why did somebody do this? And it turned out it was the PR firm who was doing the publicity for uh, Discovery, Chan Discovery Canada's Shark Week. So they're like, let's make something up, and let's, fool, let's get some, you know, some discussion about it. So like, there's different motives that people will sometimes make stuff up. In this case, it was publicity. Probably not a great way to build a good relationship with, with journalists, but you know, that's, an, that's another talk. Uh, then there's the category that so many people fall into. Um, you know, and, and these are the folks who see something, and they, they want to share it, and they want to spread it and they don't realize they unknowingly are putting out false or misleading information. This is an example from Hurricane Sandy. And, uh, and so this is obviously an incredible photo. And it's also completely fake and photoshopped. Uh, the cloud was taken from a storm in Iowa years earlier and combined with a, a Statue of Liberty photo. And so what you see here is um, the number of shares at the time I took the screenshot was almost 300,000, which is insane. That's a huge amount of shares. If you were running a large Facebook page for a media organization, you got 300,000 shares for something, you'd be, you'd be like running around high-fiving everyone, OK? And this is just this is a regular guy who shared this photo, and it went insane during Hurricane Sandy. And, uh, and so what happened is, at some point, he realized that this photo was fake. And so what I'm pointing to there in the arrow is a message from him. And it says, apparently, this pic has gone viral from my wall with 99,989,000 shares. So that was like 200,000 shares ago he posted this. Um, and so he writes that, um, so I called the person who texted it to me, and then she called her friend who sent it to her, and it's in New York, and he told her that it was fake. So he'd gotten it like third or fourth hand. He was like, oh, this is an amazing photo. I'm going to put this on Facebook. Blows up, goes crazy. He realizes it's fake. He feels really bad about it. He posts a comment. 200,000 more shares happened in the span of however many hours, you know? And it just kept going and going. And so this is what can happen today, because all of us are kind of these nodes on a network where sometimes if we're propagating things, we're not going to get like 300,000 shares, but we are adding to it. And so everybody, and especially journalists, you have to think about, if I'm putting this out there, what are the consequences if it's not real? And am I actually helping you know, add to the pollution that's out there in terms of information? So this is a really, it's an important thing for everyone today in a network society to think about. Um, this is another example, not from an average person, but from a very trusted source. When those horrible shootings happened in Dallas of police officers, Dallas police put out this photo of a guy saying, this is somebody, you know, this is a suspect. And he was just a guy who'd been out walking, and it's an open carry state, so he had a, an assault rifle with him, because it's Texas. Uh, and, you know, and so this happened, and he actually, and what was amazing is that there was actually video of him walking up to a police officer and handing over his rifle because he didn't want this to happen to him, and it happened anyway. And, uh, and so even official sources will fall for stuff sometimes and will make mistaken um, assumptions. And this particularly happens in times of crisis, uncertainty. It's not a coincidence that you had a lot of stuff from Hurricane Sandy and from a mass shooting like that. This is, this is when, as we're processing information, there's a lot of mistaken stuff that comes out. And I'll sort of give, there's a really basic kind of human behavior piece that's really important to that. Um, and then there's also people who knowingly and are actively involved in spreading misinformation. So you, know, you have the hoaxers who are kind of creating it. And then you have other people who might be actually like, yeah, I know this is false, but I want to put it out there. Or people who are actually part of coordinated campaigns. And like one of the, the, the most common examples today is probably just straight up internet trolls, like your 4chan, 8chan, tri people, who are, who are trying to think about how they come up with things to spread that are false, you know, to mess with people or what have you. Um, this example is from a few years ago. And, uh, and so these two tweets are both talking about the same thing, about an explosion at a chemical plant in Louisiana. And there's even like a CNN homepage there talking about it, an incredible photo. And so that, that hashtag actually trended on Twitter. But the incredible thing is that like, there is no chemical plant 
And I don't even think there's a Centerville, Louisiana. Uh, there may be, but there's no chemical plant there. That is a completely Photoshop CNN thing. That's a photo from something completely different. And yet it's still trending on Twitter. So how do they do that? Um, they did that with bots. And so, uh, so you can see here, there were tons and tons of accounts that were tweeting the same thing with the same hashtag. And this is a really kind of clumsy effort. You don't see this as much now. It's not as easy to detect. But this was actually a Russian disinformation campaign. It was almost like a test campaign to see if they could make stuff trend and create something completely false. And it worked. They did a good job of it. Today, it's not as easy to identify these things because they don't have a bunch of accounts with Russian names on them tweeting in Russian. Um, you know, and so that's one piece. The second one is, is what they'll actually do is they'll activate you know, hundreds or thousands of accounts to all tweet a hashtag. And then once it trends, they delete all the previous tweets. So when you go to it and you see why is this trending, you see tweets from real people and from accounts that are actually real and tweeting things. So it's becoming harder and harder to just with kind of the naked eye to detect these things. Um, but we, there are people working on kind of automated bot detection and that kind of thing. But this is, you know, sometimes these are coordinated campaigns, whether it's by trolls or by governments, who are doing this. And it's really, and there was actually just some data this week that estimated about 15% of Twitter accounts are bots. So these are accounts that are just running on automated ways. There's also a new kind of account that we're seeing uh, coming from places where they actually, a certain amount of the time, it's running as like a computer program to cert retweet certain accounts and tweet links from certain places. And then for a few hours a day, an operator will step in and take over that account. So it actually becomes a hybrid human bot account. Uh, and that's even harder to figure out what's going on. Uh, now here's another example from, uh, from the election in the US. Uh, these are two of your classic trolls uh, who basically were going through the WikiLeaks stuff. And if you remember Pizzagate, these are tweets that sort of started helping move that along, where they went through the WikiLeaks stuff and decided that any time um, Clinton staffers, in particular John Podesta, were writing emails about food, they were actually talking about sex trafficking. And so they just like they just made that up. And they started to talk about it. And this. So this guy's like, pizza equals girl. Like they just, they're just making this stuff up. And so they actually turned this into a thing. And it combined with some other rumors and, and conspiracies that have been going around to turn into Pizzagate. So it seems crazy. And like I remember seeing this, thinking like, these guys, what are they doing? But it actually got swept up into, into something that actually sent a guy with a rifle to a pizza shop, uh, in, insanely enough. Um, and then, of course, we have uh, journalists and news websites. We. Uh, Usually not on purpose, but we are also a part of the misinformation ecosystem. Um, you know, sometimes we make genuine mistakes and we put out false information. Um, sometimes, like as in this example, we are taking something that's very dubious and very questionable and we're treating it like it's true, probably because it's going to get us traffic and clicks. And this is, this is a common thing. Uh, so this was an example when I was doing the research project. I was looking at um, how rumors were being reported by news organizations. And, uh, and at that point, I wasn't working for BuzzFeed. I was actually surprised that BuzzFeed wasn't in my research more, because I just assumed BuzzFeed would be covering anything that was spreading online. But BuzzFeed was way more reserved than I expected. And then I, I would see um, you know, other publications, a lot of like tabloid publications and others, who were just jumping on anything that was spreading. And if you remember, um, like uh, almost two and a half years ago now, this woman went on a Florida radio station, claimed she'd had a third breast surgically added to her body. And there were tons of news articles about it. And it eventually got debunked. Um, but right from, right from the get-go, it was hugely suspicious, not just because of her claim, but also she refused to have anyone come and take photos of her, aside from the photos she supplied. She refused to do on-camera on interviews. She wouldn't name who the doctor was. She wouldn't say when she had the surgery, where she had the surgery. Everything about it was really, really dubious. And yet you got headlines like this, where people are like, yep, there's a three-boobed woman. You can meet her in our newspaper. Uh, and that's. So that, that's where we are actively spreading misinformation. Um, and one of the things that I've documented kind of time and again, which is very uh, disappointing, is that the amount of engagement you get for the, for the false claim is way more than when you actually go and correct it or when you're out there debunking it. This is one of the challenges we'll talk about. But the graph on the top there, this is uh, a graphic from the New York Times that used the, the data from our project. So those, that's the level of social media engagement, the number of like shares and likes and comments for articles that claimed her, her claim to be true. And then you see the debunkings come along, but never actually reach the same level. It never really caught up. And the data on the bottom is all the, the individual stories that we logged and graded. And so the ones in, with the green dots, the 18 stories there, those are, even after it was debunked, there were still 18 stories that claimed it to have been true. So they didn't go back and update. 
The ones in the middle, or sorry, the ones in the middle are uh, the ones debunking it. There were more debunking articles overall, 20. Um, but they got fewer total shares. And then there were 11 where they never really went back and updated them, where they were like, this woman claims that this has happened, where they used that kind of hedging and flagging language. So they never updated those stories. And arguably, um, you know, there might be some people out there who still think that this woman may have had that surgery. Um, you know, and it's not a high stakes story. This is not a life and death story. But it shows how um, the way we treat stories, we often will spread misinformation. Uh, and there's another class. I talked about the hyperpartisan sites. These sites are kind of engines of misinformation now. This is something we've been documenting on my team uh, going back several months now of, of this kind of brand of political site that really optimizes for Facebook. So they, you know, they, they write headlines that, are re that really grab you emotionally. Um, they're oriented towards getting traffic from Facebook. And they really, their main bread and butter on the right and the left is demonizing the other side and giving you stuff that'll make you feel great about your political opinions and make you hate the other side. And uh, so we did an analysis uh, of, you know, we fact checked more than 1,000 posts from a selection of these sites on the right and the left. And we found that there was a significant amount that were misleading or mostly false. So here's an example. This is from a, a conservative leaning site. And it's a pretty, pretty amazing like image and a pretty crazy claim that um, you know, a black man set two white men on fire. In their sharing note on the top, they talk about Black Lives Matter thugs. Um, and they talk, and, and this video will make you sick. And then their share line is, share if you're angry as hell and aren't going to take it anymore. So you, know, you can see exactly what they're going for here. They're trying to get people angry. Um, they're very anti-Black Lives Matter. They're making a claim here about a black man attacking two white men. Um, so we saw this, and we were like, oh my god, what, what happened here? So the first thing we realized is the story was a year old. They had just like, wrote a new story and reshared this video that had happened a year earlier. Second thing was that it, um, the, the two people who got in an argument, and there was uh, one guy initially set on fire, um, and another guy who was close by ended up getting set on fire. But it was not a black man and two white men. It was, it was, uh, initially, it was an argument between a black man and another guy who isn't white. So it was not a racial thing at all. It was a work dispute. Um, had nothing to do with Black Lives Matter. Like, there's nothing, no connected to that. And it was a year old. So you can see how they took an old video, which is pretty crazy and insane to watch, but how they spun it into something that would get their audience riled up, that would get them to click, get them to share. Uh, and here's an example from the left. This came out a few days before the election. Uh, pretty crazy claim in that headline. So the head of the FBI put a Trump sign on his front lawn before the election? I mean, that, like, if you are somebody who is really angry about James Comey, like, reopening the Hillary e you know, emails thing so close to the election, this would get you furious. So we looked into it. Um, and so James Comey lives, I think he lives in Maryland now. But he has a house in another part of the country that he's been trying to sell for several years. And it's empty. And he doesn't live there. And it's got a for sale sign on it. And it doesn't have any gates around it. So somebody walked up, put a Trump sign on it uh, of this empty house that happens to belong to him. And voila, you have the headline. You know, we talked to his realtor. And they're like, yeah, he's not here. He didn't put the sign there. And so like, you could still have done the story. So it said, somebody put a Trump sign on, on James Comey's lawn. You know, maybe you could get away with that. But in this case, obviously, that's just straight up misleading. Um, he did not put a sign on the front lawn of where he lives. And so we see this a lot. And the, the hyperpartisan sites are growing. And they get a lot of engagement on Facebook. They get a decent amount of traffic. And, and they've become these propagation networks for misinformation. Um, if something really aligns with people on, on the left or really aligns with people on the right, it's going to go like wildfire, because all these sites are going to write it. And so we've done some analysis of these. Uh, we, uh, we took three on the right, three on the left. We, we analyzed, as I say, it was a little more than 1,000 posts. And we looked at the level of Facebook engagement they got. And the most important piece of Facebook engagement for something spreading is shares. The more shares it gets, the more people it's going to reach. And so we just looked at, at the median shares per post. And what we found, if you look at the red bar, so the ones on top are, are the left-leading ones. The ones on the bottom are right-leading. If you look at the red bar, those are posts that we fact check and deemed mostly false. And they have a, almost the highest rate of shares per post. So the, the more false your stuff is, the more outrageous it is, the more you're going to get rewarded with shares and with traffic, and that's money. Uh, and the, the clear bar at the far right of each of them, which is really overall the highest engagement, that's, that's the memes. Um, so content that didn't have a factual claim in it, that was just like maybe a, a picture of, you know, like this if you want Hillary to go to jail. 
like that kind of stuff, that got the highest engagement overall, which is not surprising because you don't have to click through to go anywhere. It's a photo, it's a video, it's right there on Facebook. And that stuff was the most overtly partisan um, and sometimes the most insulting. And it did, we, we rated it no factual content because it wasn't making a claim. It was just like, you know, uh, it just getting into people's partisan views. And so the more misleading you are or the more partisan you are, the more you would get rewarded. And, and that really skewed the market as we got into the election where you saw people putting up stuff that was just demonstrably false because they knew that it would get huge engagement on Facebook and that meant traffic coming to them and money. And that was like the economics at play. And that's why we had teenagers in Macedonia creating pro-Trump websites and putting completely fake stuff on it that they found in the US because that performed the best. And I talked to a guy who runs a few conservative sites and, um, and his way of explaining you know, why things got so bad in terms of the quality information, he said, you know, if I'm competing with teens in Macedonia who don't care and who will get amazing engagement for completely made up stuff, he's like, what am I supposed to do for my business? Uh, you know, he's like, they skewed the market so that I had to keep walking up to that line. And you know, Facebook has a role in that too. Uh, but obviously, you know, he made the choice to run stuff that was misleading or false. Um, but his view was that the only way he could keep his business going was to do that, which is a hell of a thing to think about. Um, and so talking about this partisan piece here. Uh, what's really important about it is, you know, trust in media overall has been declining for several decades, uh, and and trust in institutions in, in Western democracies have been declining as well. People trust the government less. They trust big business less. Uh, they trust politicians less. And journalists, I think, are seen as another big institution. We're not seen as necessarily on the side of the average person. We're seen as part of this big machine. And so I, th I think that's why we're seeing one of the reasons we're seeing trust decline. Also, what's going on now is that you know, newspapers are really struggling, and there's so many more options that I think one of the things that's happening is people are going to sources that really reinforce what they believe and, and what they want to hear. And the more that you consume that kind of content, the more the Facebook algorithm will see that's what you want, and it will feed you more of that. And so what happens is over time, you get more and more of it. And there's a phenomenon called group polarization that holds the more you are surrounded by people who have the same views as you, the more all of your views become more extreme. So if the only content you're seeing on Facebook is stuff that's really partisan and you're reacting to it, you're going to get more of that. And your views over time, without you noticing it, will actually get more extreme. And that's where that, that collapse in the middle potentially happens. Uh, and so here's a couple of like, visual examples of what that polarization looks like. With Brexit in the UK, um, you have people who were you know, in favor of, of leaving the EU in the blue there on the right, and people who wanted to stay in red on the left. And so this is the conversation on Twitter. And what you can see is like there's very little overlap. So you have these networks of people reinforcing each other who don't actually interact at all. They're living in separate zones. Um, there's not a lot of that middle ground. The second example here um, is an analysis done by Jonathan Albright, a professor in the US, who analyzed um, the linking patterns between mainstream sites and these hyperpartisan sites. And what he saw was these clusters uh, in blue for you know, Democratic and red for conservatives, clusters of these sites that were there just interlinking to each other, um, just grabbing each other's content and linking to each other, and occasionally pulling stuff from big sources like the Washington Post, New York Times, Politico, or Breitbart, or Daily Caller. But a lot of times, they existed off in their own kind of worlds. And so people get caught in these kind of echo chambers. And they're not seeing stuff from other sources. And if the algorithm sees that they like this stuff and they react to it, the algorithm gives them more of it. And this is one of the challenges we have in our media environment today, is that we don't even realize that this, these decisions are being made for us. If we get a lot of our news from Facebook, um, it's, it's going on our, our reactions and the signals we give the algorithm. And it's going to feed us more of things. And we don't even necessarily realize we're getting more of one thing and less of another. And over time, you, you get this kind of thing. Uh, and I think this tweet sums it up pretty well. Whoever has the most people and activates them the most effectively determines what truth is. If you have a massive network of hyperpartisan liberal or conservative sites and you get information that you know they're going to go for, and they're going to push it out for you. They're going to get it out there. And so you start to have these alternative media universes. And whether it's true or not matters less, whether it's factually accurate or not, matters less than how many people can you get it to and how much reinforcement can you get for it. And this is what we're seeing, people activating these partisan networks, whether it's on Twitter or in websites or in other places. And, and I see more and more, it's, it's like a, a great reawakening of partisan media um, that's happening online. So uh, then we come to fake news. And so remember, I, I personally define it as completely fake stuff created by people knowing it's fake, doing it for an economic motive. 
And I did kind of a roundup of you know, top fakes from 2016. Again, completely fake stories. These were the biggest um, political ones. And you know, so the, the biggest one was about Obama banning the Pledge of Allegiance. Uh, and that was by the same guy who did the paid protester one. That went right to people who hate Obama and believe he wants to take away all their freedom. Um, the, the, pope being, the pope endorsing Donald Trump you know, did really well from a site, like a totally dubious site again. So these were the kinds of things that we saw. And for political hoaxes, 2016 was, was massive. Um, they saw huge engagement on Facebook. People made money. Uh, and uh, it's starting to calm down a bit now that Facebook and Google have, have brought in some measures. But it was a big year. Um, I started looking at these kinds of sites in 2015. And I, by the end of that year, I had a list that was probably about 12 to 15 sites, um, which I thought was a real problem at that point. Um, and so you know, we're in 2017 now. Um, and I have a list. Uh, this is actually out of date. I have well over 100 now. Um, now, the good news is a bunch of them are now inactive. This is the GIF I made for you. I work at BuzzFeed, so I have to make GIFs. Okay. Uh, and, uh, and so a, a bunch of them are dead, because we've reported on them and they've taken them down. Or a bunch of them have been kicked out of the lucrative Google AdSense advertising program that you can sign up for and get ads on your site really quickly and easily. Um, but we still see new ones being launched all the time. Just last week, I wrote about a site that in less than two weeks got more than a million views. In less than two weeks from not existing, it got more than a million views. And the guy did it, he said, as a joke. I, I'm really tired of people saying, I just did a fake news website as a joke, and also putting ads on it, because it's not a joke. You're making money. Um, but it's getting, the good news is it's getting harder to make money. He made $600. Uh, because he didn't have ads on it right away. It took him a couple days to get approved. He never should have been approved in the first place. Uh, and, and so the money is not as good as it was this time last year, and especially come like October, November. But it's still there for people to take. Um, so fake news is not completely new. It's not new to journalism. Uh, it's been around for a long time with people just making stuff up. And one of the key connections between the past and today is, is that, that desire to get a very large audience. Um, so if you're dealing with scale and mass, that's where we start to see this kind of fake news stuff happen. And for me, one of the best examples is from 1835. Uh, a guy named uh, Benjamin Day decides to start a newspaper in New York. And at that time, newspapers cost about six to nine cents. And they were mostly read by the mercantile class and upper class people. There was nothing really for the masses. And they made their money primarily from that subscri subscription fee. And, uh, and not that they were like the most you know, perfect and accurate things, but you know, they, ha they had some standards. And so then Benjamin Day comes along and decides, I'm going to sell a newspaper, and I'm going to sell it for a penny, and I'm going to get as many people to buy it as I can, and then I'm going to sell that audience to advertisers and make most of my money from advertisers. That has been the model of media for you know, the last, since then. That's been the model. You aggregate a big audience, and you sell advertising to that audience. Now, of course, there are trade publications and smaller ones that rely on subscription. But when we talk about newspapers, they typically have lost money acquiring subscribers, lost money servicing those subscribers, getting the newspaper to their houses. But having that subscriber base that is proven and that gets the paper every single day, you can then go and sell that to advertisers. That's been the model. And so Benjamin Day decided to get as many people as he could. He was the guy who came up with the idea of the uh, this newspaper street sellers. He had young boys go out, sell newspaper hawkers. He came up with that on the street. And then uh, in 1835, to really get their subscription up, they ran a series. Uh, and the series was based on a really famous astronomer going to South Africa with a fabulously new, powerful telescope and looking at the moon for the first time with it. And they ran a six-part series explaining what they saw on the moon, which included half men, half bats walking around. <laughs> and they, day after day after day, they just made up new stuff that was on the moon. And subscription went through the roof. Uh, they, at one point, they boasted that they had more subscribers than the Times of London, which was the biggest newspaper in the world at the time. Uh, I, I gathered some research from a, a guy who was doing his master's and had looked at this. And he said that that claim was also false, that he doesn't think they actually surpassed the Times of London. But they had a pretty big spike. And so it's a great example because it shows how him changing this model and going for like a really big mass audience, it kind of, kind of skewed what he was doing. And it's like that guy who was running the conservative site I mentioned, where he says, well, you know, trying to get that engagement, trying to get that mass 
audience on Facebook, it started to skew the market. And I think there is a connection between scale and, and that kind of element of fake news and, and you know, the standard slipping a little bit. Um, what we have today is different. We have a massive abundance of information. Um, you know, again, everybody's vying for your attention. Huge amounts of information going up on Facebook, on other places all the time. And you have to find ways to cut through. And so people are trying to figure out how to do that. It also, um, I think it occurs to people that, well, rather than trying to like, you know, actually come up with stuff that people like and people share and then build an audience, why don't I just make stuff up? How about that? You know, it's a much cheaper business model than actually trying to build an audience. Um, and that's where kind of the, the last two things come in. I talked a little bit about algorithmic filtering. The fact is if you can you know, get it in there and get people reacting strongly to it, the algorithm is going to kind of take care of things and push that out to more and more and more and more people. Um, the second thing is that low barrier to entry. You know, it uh, wasn't that long ago you needed to uh, you know, buy ink and you needed to buy expensive printing presses and all these things to launch a newspaper or another kind of media outlet. Today, you, know, you spend 10 bucks, you get a domain name, you put on a free WordPress site, it looks reasonably professional, um, you start putting stuff on Facebook, and you can actually get somewhere. Um, it's easy to put ads on it. Within a day or two, you can get approved for an ad network. Now, today, it's harder if you're doing 100% fake stuff, as it should be. But in general, it's very easy to get a site up, have it look reasonably professional, find some monetization on it. But you have to get a lot of people to earn money when you're doing that low-level kind of advertising. And so that's where this comes in. They feel like it's an easy way to capture attention and to get people in. Uh, and so when we look at fake news today, again, for me, it's financially driven. If it's, if it's political, it's propaganda. Um, I mostly find smaller sites run by individual people. They tend to often be guys running a side hustle. Just like I found one guy in California who has more than 40 fake news sites. He ran more than 700 false articles last year. And his day job is as a, as a, a charter pilot. So it's like in between he's doing this. And it's, it's a scale play. Uh, and uh, and you know, so they're, they're getting those kind of basic low rent ads on it. And the idea is just like, how do I get people onto my website so I earn pennies from each view? And so they just make stuff up and they figure out what gets a reaction from people. Um, so I talked about, so why do we fall for this stuff and why do we share from this stuff? So there's two key things here to think about. So the first thing, obviously, is that we love information that tells us what we already believe. Um, humans, we have a very strong, even physiological reaction to somebody telling us something that we feel we already know or confirming something we already believe. And we get very attached to these beliefs. Uh, and it's very hard to dislodge them. And so this is, you know, it's a great quote talking about our irrational loyalty to our beliefs and how we work hard to find evidence that supports them. And then we discredit anything that goes against it. So on Facebook, if you give somebody something that conforms to their view of a particular politician, they're going to be like, yes, like, share. If it's something that goes against that, they're going to be like, why the hell is this in my feed? Um, and, and the algorithm's going to learn that over time. Uh, so that's one piece of it. On a fundamental level, we accept any information that aligns with what, what our beliefs and our biases are. We reject things that go against that. We think we're rational. We're not. The way we process information is not in a rational way. And it's particularly important for journalists to realize this because we somehow often think we're, we're exceptions to that. And we're not. We have the same tendencies as everybody else. The second thing I mentioned earlier is you know, that wasn't a coincidence that Hurricane Sandy and the shootings in Dallas saw a lot of misinformation spread. Um, and that's because in times of uncertainty, where we lack information, where we have a lot of anxiety, we try to fill in the gaps. If we're missing information, we want to try and figure out what's going on. And that's how, as social beings, we start to talk about, well, why did that happen? Well, I heard that this was going on. And that's how we start to create and spread rumors. And so it's a natural human tendency. We're trying to make sense of the world around us. If we don't have all the information, we start to actually make it up. It's something that we all do. And that's why you see rumors and stuff run rampant in situations where there's fear and anxiety and where we don't know the whole story yet. And the folks who do this kind of misinformation, like they play to these things. They play to emotions. They play to fear. And that's how his stuff works well for them. Um, here's two nice Canadian kids uh, who run a network of fake news websites here in Canada. Uh, and the quote from one of them, actually, I think they've taken down at least one of their sites. But I did a profile of them back in August. And genuinely, they're really nice kids. They're smart guys. They just they figured out that a great online hustle was to combine two things. Um, so one, to write false stories, but about two things. One, Justin Trudeau, and two, weed. And you put the two of them together, and it was fake news magic. Uh, 
they sent me one of their, their monthly advertising statements. Their best month, they earned like 12 grand Canadian. And I don't say this to encourage any of you to do this. All right? This is not a good business idea. It's, it's much harder now, as I said, to earn money. Um, but you know, these are teenagers, but they get it. They totally get it. And this is a quote from one of them. You realize that people, people believe a lot of things online, so we use that to our advantage. They just told people what they wanted to hear. Um, and some of their stories were kind of amusing stuff, but they also like they ran stories like Trudeau being arrested for domestic assault. And they ran stories, uh, you know, a hoax about a Syrian refugee being found as a terrorist. And so over time, like they were trying different things, and it, it wasn't really occurring to them of you know, the biases and the fears that they were feeding into with these kinds of things. Uh, so why was the election such a big thing for fake news? Well, it just everything I've talked about, it just put all of them together. Huge amount of attention there to be captured um, around the world. So uh, go after it. Strong emotions, strong beliefs. You had, you had you know, widespread misinformation, because there's always misinformation in political campaigns. And in particular, Donald Trump was just saying stuff that was not true all the time. So it lays the groundwork, makes it easier to put other stuff in. And then, of course, we have um, that algorithmic filtering. And all that stuff just put it together. And it was like, it was like this perfect storm. And I was, I was just like looking at the stuff every day that was spreading. It was unbelievable to me the traction it was getting. Uh, and so I, at one point, I did uh, a little bit of research. And I took all the fake sites that I knew of and all the fake stories I knew of from the election. And I, I tallied up their total number of shares, reactions, and comments on Facebook. And I divided it into like nine months before the election, six months before the election, three months before. I wanted to see like what was the trend of Facebook engagement for fake news. And what I saw was that red line was that it really spiked in those critical three months before election day. So obviously, it captured a lot of attention then. And then I, to kind of benchmark it, I went and I found the top performing election stories from 19 of the biggest English language news websites in the US and looked at, OK, so how did their stuff do? And, and so you see that for them, engagement actually went on kind of a downward thing. And I, it's important to note, these are the top 20 of real election stories from 19 major news websites and top 20 from completely fake stories. So it's not, it's not overall. Obviously, real stories got way more engagement and way more traffic overall uh, during the election. Uh, fake news didn't get, get more in total. But when it came to the viral hits, which is what fake news lives and dies on, they actually did better than the sort of viral real news stories. And that was pretty shocking. I didn't expect to see that. Uh, and so you know, how, do we, how do we deal with this? Um, you'll notice that most of this presentation is on how terrible things are. And then I have like a small piece of like, all right, what do we do about it? The truth is, like, I don't have, I don't have all the answers. Uh, I've been sort of researching and writing about this for years. But the good news is that people actually care about this area right now. It was this weird little niche that me and a few other people were in for a long time. And so like just this week, um, the Knight Foundation and a couple other funders have pledged a million dollars in funding for ideas about how to combat online misinformation. Um, I'm sorry to say it's only available to US applicants. Um, they give $50,000 grants. But uh, if you can find a US person to partner with, then by all means, you should submit. But there are some best practices out there for dealing with misinformation where you don't need money to do with it. And here's a few that have been kind of built up by science over the years. So the first one is a lot of times we're attached to our ideas. Even if it's very casual knowledge, being wrong isn't something that humans deal with very well. And so when you're actually trying to correct somebody, don't call them stupid or dumb or what have you. know. Don't attack them. And so this idea of you debunk the, the idea, not the person. Um, don't make it personal. You have to find a way for somebody to actually figure out how they can kind of let go of that belief and feel comfortable to admit maybe they were wrong, or comfortable at least to kind of listen to you. So don't attack them. Don't post on their, their Facebook profile and be like, you're such an idiot. Look, Snopes debunked this a week ago. You know, It doesn't help. Um, I encourage you to talk to people in person, in fact. It's, like, people often ask me, like, what do I do with my family member? They share the worst stuff. It's like you should actually talk to them face to face is the first thing. Um, so think about that. Remember, debunk the idea, not the person. The second thing is that um, stories. I talked about a few different human characteristics, things that are fundamental. So one of the most fundamental things about our existence and how humans interact is through narrative and story. And, uh, and it's, it's one of the most powerful things that we have in our arsenal as, as journalists and storytellers. And so rather than just sort of going out and saying, no, that's not true. 
Um, you, if you can build kind of an, an alternative narrative for them of like, yeah, I know, that's, it seems like that's what happened, but actually, here's what actually went down. And if you tell them a story and you find a way to kind of bring them into it and give them something that seems like a logical progression and they can become part of that, then that's actually very, very effective. Um, so storytelling is extremely, extremely powerful and important. Um, so what does choose the right sources mean? A lot of times, the best way to get somebody to let go of a piece of false information, it may, may be to actually have someone other than you explain it to them. And what I mean by that is, if you've got something like you know, claiming that a, a Donald Trump protester was paid, and you have somebody who's pro-Trump who believes that that's the case, um, if me from BuzzFeed comes along and tells them that, and they're a hardcore Trump supporter, they may not believe me because maybe they don't have a great opinion of BuzzFeed. Um, but if I can get somebody from the conservative community or from the Trump campaign to say that, yes, we've looked and we don't have any evidence of, of paid protesters, that is what will convince them. Uh, so the more that you choose sources, people who can communicate the information to them that they feel are aligned with them and on their side, that works. So for journalists, you really need to think about that. If you're trying to knock down a piece of misinformation and you only choose people from kind of one side of the divide that the folks who are most susceptible to the misinformation may not trust, you're probably not going to get through to them. So try to find sources that people will actually identify with that will enable them to kind of feel like they're, you know, they've got someone that they trust talking to them. Uh, and then the last thing here is uh, remember that anytime you actually mention the false stuff, you're adding to its exposure, and, and, the, and there is a connection between repetition and belief. When it comes to rumors, it's been documented over many decades that the more someone hears a rumor, the more likely they are to believe it. So in the act of knocking something down, the worst thing you can do is like stand up and, and scream the false thing. And so like an example of this is rather than saying Barack Obama is not a Muslim, you would say Barack Obama is a Christian. And so when you think about actually crafting your narrative, you want to craft the narrative to express things in the positive and to minimize the amount of repetition of the, of the false stuff. And here's an example of that that was done by um, people who, it's, it's a great, really easy to read book called The Debunker's Handbook, or sorry, The Debunking Handbook, um, created by some, some people who work in the area of climate science. Now, why would people in climate science need to do this? I'm trying to think. Um, and so this is an example where they're trying to get rid of this, this perception that you know, there isn't scientific consensus on, on uh, climate change. And so they start with the headline, you know, again, positively expressing that a significant percentage of climate experts agree that humans are causing global warming. Um, you know, they back it up with some more data. They create an infographic that sort of conveys that, yes, there actually is agreement. Um, and, but then they get to a point here where they sort of like, they prepare the people for the myth. They say, however, some movements, uh, movements that deny a scientific consensus have always sought to cast doubt on the fact that a consensus exists. So they're like preparing the reader saying, listen, some misinformation is about to come at you. And then they give it, and they give the claim, and then right away they kind of refute it. And so, so you actually have to think kind of strategically of how you put the claim in there, the false stuff, and how you wrap it around all these other things that might be a little more persuasive. Um, one of the other neat things, this was, again, during Hurricane Sandy, something that The Atlantic did. There were a lot of, of false photos uh, spreading around. One of the most common types we see is you know, a photo from another natural disaster. People saying, hey, this just happened on my street. Happens a lot. Happens in war zones. Like, uh, and so what they decided to do was they realized that you know, these photos were spreading on Facebook. So if you just write an article and people have to share the link, it's not as effective as actually creating an image where all the debunking information is embedded in it. You know, uh, the badge saying it's real or it's fake, saying where it came from, and giving a shortened URL that people could easily type in if they wanted more information. So that was something that was packaged for the social environment. One of the things we're going to work on uh, at BuzzFeed is we have a, a video producer starting soon producing uh, videos specifically for Facebook to knock down stuff that's spreading on Facebook. Much, it seems like it's much better to do that than to write a story. Last example is something that Facebook is actually doing right now. They're working with fact-checking organizations in the US and in Germany uh, and in the Netherlands, I think, is the newest place they've gone to, where if at least two of the fact-checkers they're working with declare something to be false, there's this little flag on the bottom of, of the false item. Now, I mean, the weird part about this is they're only doing this for stuff that's 100% false, and yet it's labeled disputed. Um, so what, like, why is that? Why wouldn't Facebook just say, like, this is bullshit, or just like, remove it? And Facebook is, is, and they should be, they're very sensitive to censorship on this. 
Uh, and they've, they've come under fire from a lot of conservatives saying that, you know, you're a company in Silicon Valley, you know, you're people who review content are liberals, you're going to censor us if you start doing this. And so they're trying to tread very carefully at flagging and labeling stuff for people and reducing its spread, but they don't want to actually start removing stuff and blacklisting sites. Because once you start to create blacklists, like who, who goes on and who doesn't go on the blacklists? And one of the worst things I saw as fake news became a big concern after the election was people circulating blacklists saying, these are, here's 300 fake news sites. And when I looked at these lists, like some of them were just you know, ideologically driven websites, liberal sites, conservative sites. And, and like, that's, it's, it's not about getting rid of all partisan media. That's, that would be a terrible, terrible thing for free speech. Partisan media has been around for a very long time. Um, but stuff like this, Seattle Tribune story, is 100% false. And so there is hopefully a little area to carve out for that. Um, and so those are some of the efforts that are happening right now. Uh, but you know, uh, it, for, for journalists, a few pieces of advice here uh, towards the end. One, realize that, that you are not excused from these biases that affect everybody else. Too many times we think we aren't and we are. Um, I personally, I cover, for my job, not surprisingly, I cover Facebook and Google like they're governments. I have accountability-oriented reporting, and I think be aware of that. Be aware of the power that they have in the digital society, and think about them as places that you, you need to hold to account as well. Um, and I think, you know, I talked a lot about algorithms today, and that's not by accident. I think journalists in particular, and the average news consumer, especially if you're on Facebook, has to think about what, what, what role are algorithms playing in particular, what role are they playing in what they show you, but what also they don't show you. And I think that element of literacy and thinking about that is really important. Um, and, you know, <laughs> The, the other one is that the partisan sites are really good at evoking emotion, and they really get people to react. And there's something to learn from that. Uh, but you also have to make sure you don't abuse it. And, uh, and so figuring out how we can tell great stories and get people to emotionally connect with things, with the truth, with facts, um, rather than having to manipulate them, like some of the examples I showed, is, I think, one of our big challenges. And then you know, the last thing, to go back to that that early point about unintentional propagators for everyone, especially if you're a journalist and in kind of a position of influence, you have to realize like we're all a part of, of these networks. And each action we take, you know, whether it's retweets or shares or reactions uh, on different social networks and sending it to people in messaging apps, like we're help you're helping spread something. So choosing and thinking about what you're gonna spread and taking that extra little pause is a really, really great habit to develop. And in particular, if you read something and you get a very strong emotional reaction to it, that's the best time to not share something. Uh, <laughs> which seems totally counterintuitive, but that's, that's the point, is to take that extra second and be like, why am I reacting this way to it? To actually read the thing, because there's studies that show people share stuff without reading it all the time. To see, you know, does the body text actually match the headline? Is there something here? Um, and honestly, if more people did that, if more people took that extra pause, you know, I think we would, we would have a much better information ecosystem, but there are folks who are actively exploiting us um, to get it the other, going the other way. So I, I hope that that was helpful and interesting to you, and I hope that the next time you see that thing that gets you so angry, you just take that little extra pause. Thank you. the room pretty soon, but I think we have time for a couple of questions. All right. Would, would that be okay? Yeah. yeah. Do, we, do we need to give them a mic, or I'll just repeat yeah, it, I guess. Be loud. Okay. Right. Yeah, so the question was, what do I think about mainstream media being labeled fake news? And she works in media relations, wondering, you know, uh, for, for people in, in your role, how can you help sort of people distinguish? So, I mean, obviously, it's been insane for me to watch a term that uh, didn't exist for most people like five months ago, suddenly something the president is saying to CNN. Um, you know, C CNN was fake news, and then they were very fake news. We were a, a failing pile of garbage, which is like, I don't know if that's, is that better or worse? 
so I mean, it's just like these are these are uncharted waters of the president of the United States calling news organizations fake news. Um, that's you know, like I don't I don't have the perfect thing other than to say like I, I think that is it's surprising, and uh, and what's going on is that I think you know his campaign. Uh, you know the media has been has been very critical of him and didn't take him seriously from day one. So his campaign was built in opposition to the media in a lot of ways, and he activated networks of people, uh, supporters, doing things other than necessarily going out um, and doing a ton of kind of big mainstream media. He did a lot of cable. He got a lot of airtime because he would say crazy things during debates, and he used that to his advantage to, to build support. And so you know right now like there 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 are people. I get into my Twitter mentions. Who you know who are calling journalists all the time fake news, and there is pushback on that. And I think the opportunity for that was created by the erosion of trust over time, which we as journalists absolutely bear some responsibility for. And so the hopeful end of it is that I think it's invigorated a lot of news organizations um, to invest in investigative reporting, to really communicate their value, and to spend more time on stuff that that is is more important. And so I think that's a good piece of it. But it, there is an active campaign to undermine. Um, the influence of of large media institutions, and today, with a lot of them frankly collapsing, like there's there's definitely danger in that for media professionals and others. I mean, I think obviously, if you're going to uh, speak up, and uh, even just as an individual person, like speaking up when you see something like this happening on social media, or uh, or speaking up in in your case, you know, choosing to deal with reputable outlets and not going to other ones that you know maybe uh, you feel like are starting to get some audience. But aren't really, you know, dealing with facts is an important thing. I mean, we all have choices to make. You choose what stuff you want to consume. You choose what stuff you want to share. You choose what kind of outlets you want to deal with. And if everyone is conscious of that, and I'm sure there's a lot of organizations. I don't work in a place that asks you to pay, but there's. I'm sure a lot of newspapers would appreciate you buying subscriptions as well, you know, uh, and supporting that. In Canada, we don't have a really big fake news problem because our population is smaller and the economic opportunity is smaller. But we do have the declining trust in media, and we do have, you know, for example, like the Rebel, which is becoming a platform for the alt right and for Islamophobia in Canada. And so, like, there is stuff that's happening here, and and I think just being conscious is is a really important piece of it. Yeah. Um, so we we talk a lot when, when we're talking about fake news or misinformation. We talk a lot about Facebook, um, but obviously this is on other platforms as well. And the one that comes yeah. to mind is YouTube. So if you mm. look at YouTube as, a, as its own ecosystem, you watch one YouTube video that is quote unquote fake news or just right. totally unreasonable conspiracy theory. And then the related mm -hmm. videos are all yes. the videos. Yes, give you more, that. yes. So, so what, do, what do those organizations need to do to address it? Yeah, so the question was about, uh, it's not just Facebook, YouTube. Um, and So YouTube is a huge place for conspiracy theories. Uh, and there are people just churning these videos out day in, day out. The Pizzagate stuff, there was a lot of stuff on YouTube for it. So what responsibility, he was wondering, uh, does Google have? And they have a lot. And frankly, you know, we just ran a story a couple weeks ago about YouTube. And I, and I think it's, it hasn't been part of the conversation, and it needs to be, because there's, there's people with like hundreds of thousands or millions of followers on YouTube who are actively putting out misinformation all the time. You know, if you want to go see all the, you know, anytime there's a big shooting or you know, a mass shooting, the, the videos within minutes are on YouTube of them accusing everyone who's been killed as being crisis actors and it being a false flag. And that's like there right away. So um, YouTube does have a responsibility. Um, I think they, they need a little more pressure than they've had so far, to be honest with you. A lot of the pressure on YouTube has been, or sorry, on Google, which owns YouTube, has been for the autocomplete in search, where it's like, um, did the Holocaust and then it would autocomplete really happen? And like, and in some cases, Google will actually give you a very top highlighted result that will have misinformation in it. Uh, and then the other one is their ad network, AdSense, where a lot of fake news sites were in there and making money. And they, booted, they booted 200 of them last year, 200 publishers last year. Um, there are almost 2 million in, in AdSense in total. So, uh, so on, on the YouTube front, I, I, think, I, think, I think Google has a really big problem because uh, there's, this stuff is big on YouTube. Um, the first thing that I think they'll probably do is they'll start restricting the ability of those accounts to get ads on them. So that's the first piece of it is like if people are living, living and dying by the money, if you start to choke off the money, it may actually reduce the amount of content. So I think that's, that's the first thing they should do is uh, figure out ways to block 
the ads from going on those. Um, and I think there's a role for brands in this as well. Like a lot of brands, they'll do a digital ad buy and they have no idea where their ads actually run because they buy an audience rather than before where they were like, yeah, we'll be in the New York Times, we'll be in McLean's, blah, blah, blah. And now they're like, all right, we're going to spend $2 million. We want men interested in buying a car between 25 and 35 years old. And then that gets placed on these, these networks. And so brands need to take control of this, too, to make sure their, their stuff doesn't show up on these sites. And that conversation is now happening. I see um, advertising industry people and others getting really involved. So um, hopefully there will be more attention on YouTube this year. All right, should we do one more? Yeah. One more. Right. Yeah. Um, so the question was, what do I think about people like John Oliver who use satire to debunk stuff? Um, and it's weird because, like, if you remember, John Stewart used to describe himself as fake news when he was doing The Daily Show all the time, right? Um, so now that term has been taken away from him. And uh, I think, so we talked about, like, the power of narrative and storytelling um, and, and other ways of kind of getting through to people. I think humor and satire are tremendously effective. The one downside, of course, is uh, is like, are they are they necessarily reaching the people who are most exposed and most likely to believe the misinformation? Are they kind of preaching to the choir? Is like I, the only critical thing I would say. But the fact that they're doing the stuff that it's entertaining, um, you know, John Oliver has fact checkers. Like I have, I've been called by John Oliver's fact checkers when they were working on their fake news stuff. So they're actually extremely diligent and they take that responsibility really seriously, even though they would never say, well, no, 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 we're not journalists, we do a comedy show. They actually take it really seriously. So I think, I think it can be tremendously powerful and, uh, and it's a good thing that they're out there doing that. Um, okay. Thank you so much. Thank you all. Thank you.